Good evening, church. For time's sake, I'm going to just start on the existing protocol and um, start preaching. Amen. I greet all the servants of God in the house and all the members of the church. I, I bless God for your lives. Your lives will be a good testimony in the name of Jesus. Tonight, what I have here will suffice me for a three hours teaching. But um, we are not used to that. Hallelujah. But I don't know how long we are going to have to play um, by the rules of the world around us. Because if we are going to build and become people that are strong, I'm yet to see a church in our present contemporary setting that's as strong as the Corinthian church. Praise the Lord. I don't know whether you're with me. The Corinthian church was one of the most charismatic churches that Paul ever had. It was very charismatic. But even at that, none of us have measured up to the church of Corinth, even though the Paul said that they were babes. I don't know whether you understand me, Pastor. He said they were babes, but we have not measured up. That was a church that everybody in the church was gifted by the Holy Ghost. There was, all the gifts were normal, they were common, they were common things that they saw in church. And so Paul needed to write an epistle to them so that he could regulate the way they were operating. Hallelujah. I wish we can have that kind of church. Where someone will just come, there will be prophecy, there will be the work of the evangel. They will just, things will just be happening. Hallelujah. It's like you coming to church and somebody is telling you the story of your life. Hallelujah. You will get born again. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. I pray we can do that. But then Paul said they were, easy. Paul said they were children. But the strongest church that Paul founded was the Ephesian church. Paul could start his preaching from evening and preach till morning. That was 12 hours preaching. Only one man slept. Only one man slept. So you can now understand when Jesus began to write to the seven churches in Revelation, the church of Ephesus was commended. He said, you have tested those who claim to be apostles and you have found them to be liars. That was the church. They knew the word of God so well that they could discern who was what and who was nothing. Because Paul dealt with them. It was from Ephesus that the gospel spread throughout the whole Asia Minor. From Ephesus. Hallelujah. I'm believing God that God will help us to raise such apostolic centers. That men will go out from there and they will turn the world upside down. In the name of Jesus. But it doesn't come with one hour teaching. No, it doesn't. You can't, get, you can't build a church like that. Let's see to me. Many of you are starting very late, pretty late in your life to learn God. So they really need to cram a lot of things, cramp a lot of things, or you cram or package things together and have you are accelerated. It's like you, you never went to school and they are telling you that you, are, you have a university admission, you know, in three weeks. Now you have to read all the syllabus since the beginning. So you know that you are really disadvantaged. And it's even, even worrisome when you are not even taking it serious. It's sad. God will help us in Jesus' name. I didn't come here to rebuke you. I just came here to bless you. Hallelujah. But the Bible says the word of God is for rebuke, <laughs> instruction, <laughs> correction, in righteousness. That the man of God may be what? Thoroughly furnished. So, um, you know, the pastor has come to start fighting us this evening. No. Now, this afternoon, uh, morning, I beg your pardon, um, I, I, I continued from where I stopped yesterday night. It was as if I, I was just flowing. And um, I want to flow into that. But as a way of uh, um, reestablishing certain things, the aspect of faith that speaks... Um, is something that I don't want us to um, gloss over because it's part and parcel of our spiritual development. The Bible says in Acts of Apostles chapter 2 that when the Holy Ghost came upon the people, 
the first thing we knew about that the Spirit was upon them was that He gave them utterance. There was utterance. They began to speak. So when we say, when we speak about the Spirit of faith, we are speaking about the person upon whom the Spirit is resting. Praise the Lord. The Spirit is resting upon you. Therefore, you need to speak. Now, hallelujah. Um, there's so much I have to say. I don't really know how I'm going to push it together. Praise God. Amen. Hmm. I'm trying to have so many scriptures. I'm trying to pick which one to use. Hallelujah. Hmm. Glory to God. So, um, amen. God have mercy. I'm just waiting upon the Lord. Where do I speak? Okay. Um, Acts 2, 4. Can you just go Acts 2, 4? Okay, yeah, there. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I pray that God, you'll begin to have utterance. The song, the choir sang, sang spoke about Holy Spirit come. If Holy Ghost come, the first thing you will see is that it will give you utterance. It will give you utterance. Holy Ghost always gives utterance. In the Old Testament, when the Holy Ghost came upon Saul, the king, the first time he had the encounter with the Holy Ghost, Samuel told him that when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, he said, do as occasion serves you. And the Bible says, when the Holy Ghost came upon him, Saul began to prophesy. Hallelujah. He began to prophesy. That's what you always see when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will begin to speak. Amen. And so if you are not speaking, if you're in a situation you're not speaking, I think we need to find out the volume of the Holy Ghost inside of your heart. It may be very low. Because you're not speaking. Of course, don't say, well, um, I don't want to embarrass myself. You don't, if the Holy Ghost is upon you, all trans will be given to you. Praise the Lord. Now, I've said that. I want, to, I want to move from there. I want to talk about two major things. I don't know whether I'll have the time to speak about that. Or three major things. I want to talk about uh, our work, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, when we speak about faith, faith is impossible without a promise. I said that in the morning. The foundation of all faith is that a promise is given to us. Now, in, in a um, Let's go to Romans chapter 4. Um, let's pick the thought from verse 16. Paul laid a foundation for us as he began to draw our attention to a life of this patriarch called Abraham. And uh, he said so many things before we got, he got here. So, but let me pick the thought from here, 16 down. He said, therefore it is of faith. Because it was argued with the... Jews as to the keeping of the law, keeping of all their laws. Do you understand? Now, I was telling them that because that's the concept of justification. What did I say? Just, the concept of justification. Now, the Bible says in John, in John chapter 3, um, verse 3, it says, except a man is born again, he cannot see. That was what Jesus said. Now, Paul approached the same thing from another direction. Telling them that, okay, you Jews are used to obeying the Torah and all that. He said, but if you are going to be justified, it is not the obedience of that that justifies you. Now, what is justification? Please, let me explain this. And that was how I explained to some people. You've come to court and there is a judge. The case against you is bad. It's bad. No lawyer can bail you out. I don't know whether you understand me. But we, you got an advocate on your behalf to plead your case and ask the judge to pardon you. Do you understand? Based on the arguments presented by the counsel, you were pardoned. Do you understand? And you, asked, you walked out of the courtroom 
free. Now, that does not mean you are not a criminal. You are still a criminal. But you were freed based on somebody else's intervention. Now, if you try to argue your case for yourself, you mess up things. Do you understand? That was what the Jews were, see, they were putting the cart before the horse. Do you, do you understand? They, they did not understand the way God was operating. And so they were, they were confusing things. So Paul told them and was trying to say here that, look, even, let us go to the beginning. God laid a foundation for our, this faith. He said, let us look at the life of this man called Abraham. That it was, what did Abraham do to merit God's attention? He did nothing. Rather that the Bible says Abraham believed in a God who justifies the wicked. Now, it's not his wickedness that God justifies. Don't, mis don't misunderstand that. What he believed God for is that only God can justify and free him of his sinful lifestyle. Do, do you follow me? And so, because he believed God and God liked it, God said, for that that you believed, I'm going to make you righteous. Do you understand me? So he said, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise may, might be sure to all the seed. Praise the Lord. In other words, God made a promise to Abraham. And God will not enforce or bring forth that promise until Abraham began to believe. Praise the Lord. Because if you're going to make it sure... The, the person collecting the promise at the beginning must believe God. That only God can fulfill this. I don't know whether you are following me. Are you following my thoughts, my thoughts here? Hallelujah. He made a promise. Looking at the natural, there was no way Abraham could have a son. Because his wife, Sarah, was barren. Not only was she barren, she was advanced in age. I think she was about 90 or thereabouts. Her case was bad, beyond bad. Her case was worse, beyond worse. Her case was closed. Praise the Lord. And so the promise became, it was now a promise. So he needed to trust God and have confidence that he who promised can fulfill it. And because God saw he trusted him, God, God counted it that this is right. Are you with me? It had nothing to do with the weak, natural weakness of Abraham. Remember Abraham told some lies. You remember, people say, Abraham lied. Well, so why was that? No, no, it's, we're not talking about lying now and his natural weaknesses. We're not talking about the weaknesses of Jacob and all those people. No, they were all weak men. That's why James said that, look, he spoke about, um, about Elijah. That he also, that Elijah, they said they were, they, were, they were all men subject to like passions. The same challenges you have today, they had the same back then. So you cannot excuse yourself. Oh my God. When you stand before God in judgment, things are going to be horrible. Maybe we're going to stand before God and start giving stupid excuses. And God will, people will stand from nowhere and say, I have faced more serious challenges than you. And I stood what do, you, what do you think he meant when he said that, that you, uh, you, by Saida and all those cities? He says, Sodom and Gomorrah will stand in judgment. Because if the works I did in you were done in them, they would have repented. And I said, well, p p God, I had no time. I was very busy. Oh, all right, let's continue. Hallelujah. Am I, am, am I making sense so far? No. It was not about his, mix, his mistakes. He had to go beyond his mistakes and see him who is invincible. And say, he alone can justify me. He alone can pardon me. He alone can bring this promise to pass irrespective of my natural weaknesses. It is that kind of faith that God is proud to associate with. Hallelujah. Have you heard it said before that God helps those who help themselves? That is a... Saying that came from hell. God does not help those who can help themselves. God helps those who cannot. 
Jacob was the one. So when you are, when you are dealing with God, it's not about how strong you are. Say, Paul right, wrote, he said, <laughs> men, brethren, he said, not many mighty were called. Not many wise men were called. Not many noble were called. So it's not about your strength. It's not about your ability. In fact, if you have abilities, you will, <laughs> except God loves you. That's when he will deal with it as he dealt with Jacob. He will remove the all of your tie. Then you become... <laughs> You'll be limping. You don't need God to break your legs, you know. Because if you humble yourself, He will not have to humble you. But if you say, God, I will not be humbled, ah, your case is, we just have to. We'll not, see, when God begins to deal with somebody, nobody will be able to help Him. We'll all be commensurating with Him and be praying. Well, God will help you, God, but we can't help you. No prayer can deliver you. Once God locks in on you, no prayer can deliver you. But so the Bible said that this promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which also is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, there were two kinds of people that Abraham parted. There's two, two kinds of lineage. Abraham had two lineage. Let me explain that. There was the lineage that came via this law of circumcision. They are called Jews. Then there is a lineage that came by the law of faith. Oh, did you get what I said? In that too, before Jesus came, the only lineage we knew of was the lineage of the Jews. They, you, cannot, you, see, you, you are not a Jew until you are circumcised. Are you with me? It is a law of circumcision that confirms you as a Jew, as a son of Abraham. God said, any son in Israel that is not circumcised, God said, I will cut his soul off. It was a law of circumcision that David took to the battlefront and had the ranting and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and all this nonsense Goliath was saying. And you know what David said? He said, who is that uncircumcised Philistine? When he declared that over Goliath, Goliath was dead. That was, he just activated the covenant of circumcision. And God had no choice but to cut off the head of Goliath. So if you are not of that lineage, you are nobody. But the story of Abraham suggests that God foreseen this reality, that one day Gentiles will be grafted in, made another provision for another kind of lineage. The lineage by faith. Hallelujah. That you don't need to go through the route of circumcision before you become a son of Abraham. I don't know whether I'm making sense to you. That there is another route, praise God, which can only come via faith. And so we saw the way he handled Abraham and took him through a walk of faith. That he now said, can we, can we continue? He said he's the father of us all. Next verse, 17. You have to move fast today. You are going to let me finish on time. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed. Even God who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. 18. Who against hope? Believed in hope. That he might become the father of what? Many nations. Now, the many nations, if it, was, if, if, the, if it was that it may become the father of one nation, the Jews have a right to say the, that scripture meant them. But if there are going to be many nations, it, it went before, beyond the Jews. Hallelujah. Yeah, they read this every time, and they did not accept the reality of it. And Paul needed to show them that this is not been written there in, your, in the Bible. Hallelujah. So that Bible says, According to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. What? Now, now, pause there and let me explain to you. When God said he was the father of many nations, what God was saying that is going to be the example, the first type of, uh, of this lineage of faith. Are you with me? Are you with me? 
so shall your seed be. How will the seed be? Those who against hope will believe in hope. If you're going to be a true son of Abraham, you must be a man or a woman that can believe in hope even when there's no reason to hope. Are you with me? You have to begin to... So I told you in the morning that when Hebrews, when Paul came to the book of Hebrews and began to explain what faith is, he said faith is the substance of things hoped for. And I said you cannot hope if there is no promise. Hallelujah. And so in the case of Abraham, what was promised to him was the promise of a son. Do you remember? But he went beyond the son. It was bigger than a son. He said in this son, so sh- the whole nation of the earth will be blessed. So it was not just a son. The son was a pathway to the promises of inheriting the nations of the earth. Are you with me? But in order to first get the son, before we can talk about the nations of the earth. Hallelujah. So after they gave him the son, we blessed the name of God. Now, I want to say this, just in passing. It was not the faith of Abraham that got Isaac. Hmm. Many of you think, thought it was Abraham that believed God and God gave Isaac. No. Read the book of Hebrews 11. It says, Sarah believed God and she received strength to conceive. It was not Abraham. It was Sarah. Sarah had to bring herself to that place where she consciously had to engage God and believed him for that promise. It was then that she conceived. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Now, she conceived and we praise God Isaac began to grow. He became a very great young man. Then one day God visited Abraham. The last exam. Abraham, sir, that your son. His mind went straight to Ishmael. That naughty boy. <laughs> that boy. I finally, I will get rid of him and his mother. He said, no, not your that boy. Isaac, the one you loved. <laughs> That you only saw, go, 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 the son of promise. Take him to the mountain where I will show you and bring him up for a sacrifice. And the bundle the boy the following day. I believe, maybe when I say, Brown, I'll ask him whether I told his wife. I don't think he told his wife. Those things you don't tell your wife. <laughs> Not after that. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> you don't tell your wife those kind of things. Hallelujah. No matter how much I love my wife, I can't tell her that kind of one. <laughs> And took the young man to the place of the sacrifice. Now, I, I, sometimes you should wonder why God said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You think God declares himself a God of a person because of the feet or the or, or acts of valor he or she has done, or things extraordinary or spectacular they've done? Now, if that be the case, what did Isaac do? Now, God should say, I'm the God of Isaac. Tell me one mighty spectacular thing that happened in the life of Isaac. Did he fight in a battle? What exactly did Isaac do? I can't, say, I can't say anything extraordinary. But I'll tell you something that endeared Isaac to God. It's called faith. It's called faith. That's why the word of God says, parents, raise up your children in the way they should go. When it is time, they would depart from it. I want to believe that Abraham had been teaching Isaac about the promise and all the things that goes around it. Are you with me? Look, he told him, you are not an ordinary child. It is through you the nations of the earth will be blessed. And he told him so many things. So the boy's life was patterned along the path of righteousness. Are you with me? Now, when they got to Mount Moriah, this is an interesting thing. The son asked a very impertinent question. He said, Dad... Behold <laughs> the fire, behold the stick. Where's the sacrifice? <laughs> where's the sacrifice? Because he's used to seeing his father make sacrifices. So where is the sacrifice? The father looked up. He will provide himself a sacrifice. Immediately Isaac knew he was the one. I hope you are following me. Now please, Isaac was not the size of that young boy, Crowley. Are you with me? Uh, if you see Kashokwe, I saw Kashokwe yesterday, tall, big guy. Now, can you imagine having Kashokwe taking him to sacrifice? 
you will find out that <laughs> things have changed. <laughs> Are you kidding me? The guy could have fought his father. You must be mad. Me? You want to kill me? Ah, I thought you loved me. I'm going back to mommy. <laughs> The man didn't raise a finger. He didn't even protest. He went with his father to the place of the sacrifice, stretched his hands, the, allowed the man bind him, leg and foot, put, uh, put the firewood, everything on him, and brought out the knife. And he did not say, Pem. Sat down there. That, he did it by faith. Faith is the substance of things for. Now, the way the Bible said it is this. Hallelujah. Let's go to, let's continue chapter 4. Hallelujah. Let's go down chapter 4. Romans 4. Um, the last, okay. Let me pick the third for. Hallelujah. Okay, this, this four is about his body. No. Okay, so, sorry, just forget that, please. I don't want to go into that. Amen. Now, this is how the Bible said it. I, don't, I think it was Hebrews or Romans. I can't particularly pick it now. The Bible said about Abraham. He said, Abraham was persuaded. I think it's that Romans 4. Except I pick my Bible. I have all these things in my Bible. Hallelujah. <laughs> 21. I pick from 21. Thank you very much. And being fully persuaded, what he had promised, he was able to also perform. Please. The Bible says, being fully what? Persuaded. I want to ask you, who did the persuading? Daddy said, Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I don't think it was the Holy Spirit. I don't think it was the Holy Spirit. I believe it was Abraham himself. He sat down and reasoned things out. That's why I said, I disagree with Franklin. Franklin is wrong. You can't work with God if your reasoning is not right. You must, because persuasion talks about reasoning. That's why I said yesterday that your reasoning, your imagination must be sanctified. That's why Paul said that, that, that your mind must be renewed so that you can reason like God. You can, you can follow his, his thought pattern, the way he's thinking. You can, you, can, you can see where it's coming from. You can see where it's going. You can see how he's going to do it. And it will be easy to walk by faith. Faith does not work against reason. The problem you have is that you reason like a natural man. That is why you and I have problems walking by faith. We reason it out like a natural man. It is not possible. And Paul said, it said it in 1 Corinthians 2, he said a natural man cannot receive the things of God because they are foolishness to him. But a spiritual man can understand it. Praise God. Abraham was fully persuaded that he that promised, he sat down to evaluate who is this God that is making this promise. Now, uh, if pastor promised to give me 20 pounds, I can trust him. Because when I look at him, he can give me 20 pounds. Hallelujah. But if he comes to me and says, pastor, man of God, I'm going to give you 20 million pounds. Uh, are you, do you understand me? <laughs> I know you get there, but I have to look at certain things. Amen. I'll look at his, does he have ring? Does he have his shoe? I will say, what am I doing? I'm reasoning. But when I see his package and uh, I, I collaborate the story with daddy, he said, man, the guy has some very big mansions. He has this business. He's a brother-in-law to uh, Microsoft. I think I gave you this 20 million. Hallelujah. Yeah, I can believe him. Hallelujah. Do you understand? Be fully persuaded. Because he had looked at God and realized that this God is worthy of being trusted. He had concluded that there is none like him. One of us will see very interesting song. There is none like you. And he doesn't get into your real spirit, man. 
Because when it comes to the real issues of life, <laughs> there are so many people like him. We, we lie with our songs. We sing songs we don't mean. And do you not know the word of God says, every idle word a man shall say, he shall give account on judgment day. Why am I going in this direction? Praise God. So when you say, God, there is none like you. You are the great, you are the mighty, you are the everything. Okay, let us find out when you step out of here. So you now know why you need to sit down and talk to yourself. Why you need to be persuaded. This man was being fully persuaded that what he, what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. The next verse, 22. Is that not 22? 20, okay. Therefore, it was, okay, that's where it ended, Abby. Is that 23? Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Now, it was, okay. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Now, the raising of Jesus from the dead would have not be, wouldn't have been possible if Abraham and Isaac had messed up that situation. They were playing out a prophetic program. Abraham was standing as God the Father. Isaac was standing as the Son. The Son had to trust his life in the hand of the Father. You don't understand. You have to trust the Father. Because remember he went to, the, the, to that guest man and said, let this cup pass. Not my will, but your will. You don't know what was going on. I could hear God telling him. He said, let your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Is that not what the Bible says? Abraham had sacrificed his son. He did not hold back his son. I can't do less. I can't do less. My hands are tied. My righteousness must exceed the righteousness of Abraham. So he said, not my will. So Isaac was typifying the Messiah that was to come. Do you understand? But this is the issue. He who promised told Abraham his friend that this son I'm giving to you is he who will bless the world and is asking for him as a sacrifice. How does that make sense? I don't know whether God has spoken to you before and what he's telling you doesn't make sense. Praise God. Now, you don't walk into those things blind and say, hey, if he wants to do it, let him do it. Nothing will happen for the rest of your life because it doesn't work like that. You must reconcile that discrepancy in that storyline. Abraham, bring your only son. Yet this was the son through whom the whole earth will be blessed. It can only mean one thing. He who promised will bring it to pass. He will raise this boy from the dead. So in the figure, he had received him back from the dead. So when he raised the knife, Abraham was committed. He knew God would bring him back. But I must let him know that I will not hold anything back. And when he raised his hand, I was going to go down. Because I stopped there. Now I know. Now I know. And God now vowed. Said in blessing, I will bless you. You now know why they call it Abraham's bosom. Oh God, you don't know what's going on. Who, do you know the people who died before Abraham? Abel died before Abraham. Adam died before Abraham. And all the other patriarchs died before Abraham. Yeah, it was Abraham that got down and became his house. They, were, they all became tenants. Oh God. God don't know him. <laughs> because that man established a principle in the earth that God has been looking for a man to establish. The life of faith. Has to, handle, has to deal with promises. Are you with me, church? Abraham believed that God will raise him from the dead. Now God said, now you have done exactly what I wanted a man to play out. And so God became the God of Isaac because Isaac also was a man of faith. He believed God that God will raise him from the dead. Now let me tell you, up to that moment, nobody had been raised from the dead. Do you understand me? <laughs> Nobody. Now, there are times you, you ask questions. Who has it happened to before? Who has a testimony of 
I mean, look at who has ever heard that a nation crossed the Red Sea? Up to that point, nobody had ever heard about it. Every mirror, everything that God did in Egypt had never been done before. But they tried, though. They tried. I must give it to the Egyptians. Moses got there. Pharaoh, let my people go. Who is your people? He took the, he took the rod, put it on the ground, and it became a serpent. I want to believe that Abraham's, sorry, Moses' uh, rod was a tiny little snake. Are you with me? Then the magicians came and threw their rods down. They became pythons. It's my own story. I, I didn't read in the Bible. Praise him, man. I'm only letting my imagination run wild. Do you understand me? Amen. I didn't, I didn't say any vision. I'm just, do you understand? Praise the Lord. But this is the beauty of it. Because if you, if you watch, if you watch um, a, a little about animals, snakes, the, it's, not, it's, it's not usual that you see a small snake swallow a very big snake. But the beauty of Moses situation that his own small snake was swallowing up those big snakes and it was not growing bigger. It was defying all the laws of nature. Swallow one big snake. Swallow them. It will still remain small. Swallow them. It will remain small. Even at that, Pharaoh did not let the people go. But when he got to the third (laughs) miracle, they told him that this is no longer magic. We are dealing with a deity. The person we are dealing with he appears to be Lord of all. He said, no, let me, let me see. Until God killed the firstborn of Egypt before the, he allowed the people to go. Now, what I'm trying to say is that all that God does must be, you see, when you want to relate with God, it's on the foundation of faith. Your life must be a life of faith. Now, I, I have, I, let, let's, let's go to Second Peter verse 1. I'm mindful of my time. So much, I have so much I wanted to share with us, but I have to jump. Simon Peter is servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To them that have obtained like, where are you? Please stay with me. All did they obtain? A like, precious faith. The faith they gave them is, similar, is the same with the faith they give us. Excuse me. All those great apostles, foundational apostles, that you and I read about in the Bible, you can only imagine and dream that one day you will be like them. Praise God. Even if you are half as strong as them, you will be a champion in the earth. Do you understand me? What did I say you will be? Champion. You will be a champion. A man was, a man was walking. And his shadow was raising the dead. Are you kidding me? Hallelujah. I will have a worldwide, international, intergalaxy ministry. I will be the first to go to the moon and preach. Praise God. That my name may be written in the book of the annals of great men. Amen. Yet he said, the faith that made that possible is the same faith that he gave to you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? They gave us the same faith. The problem is that they used their own faith. We are not using our own faith. They use theirs. Because faith is not about the quantity. Faith is not about the size. Faith is about the willingness to exercise it. Are you willing to exercise yours? When a demand is placed on you. So we obtain like precious faith. With us, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can we continue? Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Through what? The knowledge of God. The problem Paul was writing in 1 Corinthians, I think 15. It was, it was I think 15, I don't know. 16 or thereabout. He was writing to them and he was saying to them, he said, he was rebuking the Corinthian church. He said, look, many of you don't know God. And I say this to your sheep. God is a curriculum on his own. God is a study. Can I break it down? All the universities of this earth, of this world, are simply studying nature. 
They are studying the creations of God. And many are professors in that calling. I don't know whether you are with me. You have a medical doctor, a consultant, gynecologist. What is, he, what is he a master of? How to, how to handle the reproductive organ of a woman and bring out a child. He's just a master in one area. He who created the baby himself, what do you want to call him? I don't know whether I'm making sense to you. It does, if, I, if you look at the way a way baby is formed in the womb, it doesn't make any scientific sense. No, they can explain it, but then they say cannot do it. It starts with uh, um, a sperm and the egg. Then the thing comes together. It breaks. breaks. How does he know where to make leg and make hand and make eye? I don't know whether you are with me. I give God one, three bosses. Am I talking to you? So you, the world is studying the creation of God. Christianity is studying the God of creation. You have to study the God of creation, not the creation. The world has its own school where they study the creation of God. The church is where you will study the creator of creation. So he said you need, you only get grace and peace when you increase in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You need to know them very well. You need to know when they, are, when they squeeze their eyes. You need to know why and what that means. Are you with me? You need to know when he's doing... Hmm. I don't even understand what I'm saying. You know, those that grew up in Nigeria, you should know when your parents are doing... Hmm. You should understand the meaning. <laughs> you should understand the body language and the eye language and everything. When your dad crosses his legs, you're like, hmm, hmm, something's going to happen. Judgment is coming. <laughs> Praise God. So you must increase in knowledge. Now, they can, they can keep quiet up to a particular age. After that age, <laughs> oh God, if you don't learn wisdom, if you don't learn righteousness, they will impose it on you. Praise God. Am I making sense to you? So the Bible says you also should increase in the knowledge of God and of, the, of Jesus our Lord. And that's only when grace and peace can be multiplied to you. You need to know God very well. And so say, according as his divine power. Now, in John chapter 1, verse 12, it said, as many as received him, gave he power to become. When you gave your life to Jesus, technically you are a child of God, but you are not yet a son of God. The program of God is to make you into a full-grown son. Am I making sense? He said, he gave them power to become sons of God. Now, Romans chapter 8 says a lot about that. He said, the creation was subjected to decay, not willingly, but by him who has the power to subject it to decay. But he says, it is groaning and is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And I tell people, Adam did not eat the fruit because he was in love. We have preached it as marriage seminars. Love your wife. Die for your wife. Abraham, um, Adam died for his wife. No, Abraham didn't die for his wife. Abraham didn't die for his wife. Abraham died for something much more... I don't know what word you use here. Very grandiose. Is it grandiose? Is that the word? The Bible said it was by faith. The Bible says it subjected creation to decay in hope. Adam deliberately subjected creation to decay. You call it treason. Hmm? But it was not treason. He deliberately did it. But the Bible says he did it in hope. Then you ask, what was the hope? Because for you to have hope, there was a promise. There was something Adam knew that you and I did not know. Because the Bible said, when the woman took the fruit and ate it, she gave it to her husband with her. Adam was, no, 
Eve was not in London conversing with Satan, and the husband was um, in America on a business trip. Are you with me? And so the man came back home, and the wife just said, Ah, oh, dear, 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 I just had this fruit. Can you please just taste this fruit? And the man tasted, Ah, everybody now died. No. It was with her. From the beginning to the end of the conversation, Adam was present. So Paul said, Adam was not deceived. Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived. So why did he eat the fruit? The Bible says he ate it in hope. You know what the hope was? That the so- <laughs> Praise God. Can you look at it? For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What was the hope? That this creature, that he was subjecting to vanity, to death, are you with me? To corruption. He said that they will be delivered one day when the sons of God come into manifestation. In other words, Adam knew that there was no way he could produce the kind of sons that could bring down the Luciferian government. He couldn't do it. So you know what he needed to do? He needed to eat that fruit, subject creation, and introduce the second Adam into the earth. Because only the second Adam could bath that kind of sons. Sons that are born after the spirit, not by natural flesh. The man was preaching the gospel that Paul was preaching. That is not by power, it's not by might, it's not he that runs or him that wills, but God that shows mercy. It must be initiated by God, not by man. Because the battle with evil had been before Adam was created. Hallelujah. And he knew about that battle. And he could understand the program of heaven and the subjected creation to vanity. So that the son can come into the stage. The real actor. You know when you watch film, you don't normally see the actor at the beginning of the film. You see the bad man running right out. Then suddenly the, the real actor enters the film. Then you know that the man has come. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Because the Bible said in the book of Revelation about the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. Adam knew about him. Are you with me? So he that is born of the spirit is spirit. He that is born of the flesh is flesh. Again, I say unto you, you must be born again. Because except you are born again, you cannot fulfill this promise. This is, the, this is the end game. Raising men to become sons of God. Full son. And Jesus is the full mature son of God. I said, now you come and become like me. Now it's a very tall order. Now I know why I started the meeting by saying that, look, we are, we are far, far behind time. Far behind time. There's so much of God you need to know because it is the knowledge of God that you know that begins to increase you. Just like that baby is taking milk. Oh, Paul, what, what did Peter say? He said, desire the sincere milk of the world that you may grow thereby. That's the only way you can grow. As you take milk, but you cannot live on milk forever. After a time, they must wean you from milk and begin to give you some solid food. Hallelujah. Now, what is food? In the things of the spirit, they are the teachings of God. Am I making sense? And the demands of the spirit. Many like teaching, but they don't know that it comes with responsibility. Praise God. Of course, you know that every time they promote you in class, a fresh demand is placed upon you. I might even know that. You've been on that. This is that teaching me is much difficult than when I was in the former class. Yeah, you're just be promoted. Hallelujah. You face new devils. You don't like that. Hallelujah. Every time they promote you, you meet another class of devils. Then you promote you to meet another class of devils. How do I know that? For 40 days, Jesus was tempted. Every day he was tempted until the grandmaster himself came on the last day. <laughs> the grandmaster. He didn't even bother himself. He just strolled into this venue. I said, how are you, Jesus? I said, I'm fine. I can see that you're hungry. Yeah. All right. Is it true you are the son of God? He said, I am. Then you need to prove it. So how do you want me to prove it? Those stones. Turn them to bread. 
It made a sense. So those stones just turned into bread. Have you learned about the principle of hallucination? How many of you have tried fasting? <laughs> your dream, you've just been eating in your dream. <laughs> The Bible says, after 40 days, he was hungry. My God, anything was okay for him. Under pressure. Now, they, 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 Satan, the same thing he did to Adam was what he was doing to the second Adam. Turn this bread. Turn the stones to bread. Satisfy your hunger. Satisfy your passion. Do it. And the stones began to turn to bread in Jesus' eyes. His imagination began to run riot. But he remembered the word of God. Man shall not live on bread alone. Satan said, eh, okay. Took him to the mountain. And said, behold the nations and their glories and their riches. This was what he came for. Look, we don't need to prolong this conflict. Honestly, I swear to you and to God, I won't tell anybody. Let us just come behind this place. Let us hide just, just bow. If I don't even need to kneel down, just do like this. Honestly, I, I swear, I will give it to you. <laughs> I will let you have it. <laughs> what are friends for? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Say it, say, because the, every, every victory over... Those lower demons, he faced new ones until he met the grandmaster himself. And the grandmaster left him for a season. Their next meeting was at Gethsemane. There he met him finally. There was a final conflict. He said, if you be the son of God, come down. It was him who orchestrated his going to the cross. It was the same one that said, come down. Satan is allowed to fight with any means. There are no rules in this battle. It is true that it's bound by a rule. He is not bound. So the Bible says you will overcome darkness with light. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. This is what God wants to do. That he will raise sons. Sons that have defeated hell. The best hell can send, they've overcome it. We now understand what he said, that he that overcome it will inherit all things. So this thing is not about you just marking time in church. No, look, what is at stake is more than church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail. He must build his church. He's building his church and you are the member of that body. Hallelujah. Anyone that refuses building is in danger of being cast away. Because how will you how will you how will you enjoy yourself? Or how will you feel when you see a fifty year old man with a, he has a fifty year old head and a five year old body? How will you have you ever imagined it? Fifty year old man, five year old body. Or he has hundred year old head, five year old hand, twenty year old hand, left hand, right hand. His leg is 15 year old. What kind of creature is that? You now know why Jesus has not come back. It's not Trump that is holding back Jesus. It is the church that is holding back Jesus. Because they must, he said he will come back for a church that is perfect, without wrinkle, spotless. A church that is like him. John said that this is much we know. As he is, so shall we be. So it's up to you and I to either wake up or it will discard us. Listen to me. Many years ago, God spoke to me. He used the illustration of the same story we read yesterday, Joshua, Caleb, and the 12 spies. By God's design, they were to spend 40 days in the wilderness. That was his program. And They were on the verge of entering the promised land, the land that God promised to them when they turned their back and said they will not go in. And God said, for each day you are supposed to spend in the wilderness, I will make it a year. So that was how it became 40 years. You know why it became, why that 40 years? Because all those who said that they cannot enter so that their carcasses may fall in the wilderness. 
said, the children you said will become a prey. They will go and enter that land. So I learned a principle. Any generation that tells God, we are not able to become sons of God like you said it, that generation will, will, will pass away. We we'll just waste them. You allow them to just engage in frivolous activities until their life expires. You know how long they've been preaching this message? Paul preached this message to the first generation church. They did not get there because they could not believe it. How can we become sons of God? You know why it is to become sons of God? Now, listen to me. The son of God, the, 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 the template of a son of God is not the template of Jesus that walked on the shores of Galilee, or the shores of is it Galilee or Nazareth, whichever one. No, that was Jesus of Nazareth. The Jesus of Nazareth that worked, it just came like the first Adam. Am I making sense to you? That was like the first Adam. Everything the first Adam could do was what Jesus of Nazareth did. But when he rose up from the dead, he became the, that was the first Adam was, was man, was flesh. But the second Adam became a quickening spirit. A quickening spirit. So what God is asking you to become is not a powerful man of God. He's asking you to become a quickening spirit. Now you now know, when you look at yourself as you are today, you now know that is an impossible matter. It is not possible. You now know why it has to be hope against hope. Abraham hoped when there was no basis to hope. Do you follow me? Yeah, I've, I've lost you. It's as if I'm talking out of this world. <laughs> it's the same thing. Can, you, can we believe God that is able to do what he promised? It's not, it's, look, it's not about, he's aware about your frailties. He's aware about your failings. He's aware about the challenges you go through every day. But the wisdom of God that in spite of that, if you will trust me, I will bring it to pass. Amen. So actively, every day, you and I should begin to engage him and tell him that we believe you, God, for this promise. Then to be counted to us as righteousness. We cannot allow a generation to perish. See, a generation will bring back Jesus. And what will make them bring him back is this faith. This is the faith that we draw in. You remember I said that when I come back on earth, will I find faith on earth? It's not the faith to claim. It's not the faith to say, Lord, I want, I want a car. Just give me a car. No, no, no. We're not talking about that level. You don't even need to be a Christian before that becomes yours. Hallelujah. Thank God for all the things that you've done in this country. You can get a car and get it, but in my country, you need to really believe. Even to have this kind of meeting, you have to pray. Praise God. I thank God for my country. It really helps faith. Praise God. I had done a meeting before and there was a storm. And I called the church together, let us pray. Hallelujah. And we did a prayer of agreement and we bound the rain. And when the program was about to start, the whole heavens cleared. The church, wow! I said, this is just simple faith. Amen. You have to bind Satan. You have you, Satan attacks instruments, you know. You want to do program. The instrument you have used, you, you, you just used it now. You just carry it across for the crochet ground. You put it down. The thing will just mess you up there. I think it's ordinary eyes. No, 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 no. That is, that is just spiritual warfare. 101. You learn it by those kinds. But here, you don't have such. It is pounds you are chasing. God will deliver you. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now let me retie my thoughts together. Praise God. Can we go back to that uh, <laughs> second Peter? I want to take it together. Hallelujah. It says, His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through, again, the knowledge of Him that had called us to glory and virtue. Your calling is to glory. The call is to glory. But see, many of you have not understood what it means to, gl to have glory. Look, glory, the glo look, glory, amen. When we speak about glory, from God's perspective, it's not the way man looks at glory. The glory here 
is when the life, the Zoe life of God is manifest in your being. And I will, I will give you an idea of what I mean by that life. I need to define what life is. I just hope I have enough time to, because I'm looking at that time. Paul came down, came out of a, of a shipwreck. He was shipwrecked. You know the story. And they landed on an island. And they were trying to warm themselves. And the Bible says, a viper jumped out of the fire and fastened his fangs on Paul's hands. And Paul shook off the serpent and threw it back into the fire. And people waited for him to begin to swear. But the man did not swear. The man was just normal. Eventually they became, what is in you that made that venom not to? And then that's how a revival broke up. But this is the key. This is what I'm saying. If you know snakes, at least the ones that have killed though, when you kill a snake, you've cut off his head, pour kerosene on it, and you see how his body will. Do you understand? Am I talking to you? Some, there's still an amount of life inside the body of that snake. Praise God. When Paul threw that snake back into the fire, there was no record that that snake moved. Are you with me? It only means something. By the time that he was yanking that snake from his hand, the snake was dead. Then I want to ask you, what was in Paul that killed that snake? Are you with me? That snake was a carrier of death, was an agent of death, and you all know that. Every time that snake fastens his fangs on anything, it releases death. And so something was in Paul that annihilated death that was entering his veins. Not only did it kill the poison, it also killed the carrier of the poison. It's called life. The God kind of life. Jesus carried the measure of that life. You don't understand. When Jesus hung on the tree, he would not have died. He would have just remained on that tree forever. Because the Bible says, the soul that sinneth shall die. And there was no sin. He would have just hung there. When he was tired, he would have just come down from the place and said, hey, boys, I'm fine. <laughs> and he would just see the hand healed. But Paul explained in the book of Romans. He said he was, sin was imputed on him. It became sin that we may become the righteousness of God. It could not die until sin was placed on him. That was when they could kill him. Am I making sense? When he rose from the dead, he said, I am he that is alive, was dead. Behold, I live forever. So the power of an endless life. That is the life that was given to you at new birth. It was given to you as a seed. He said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. That when it's planted, the smallest of seed, but when it grows, because the biggest, that is eternal life. It was put in you as a seed. You need to cultivate it until it becomes a mighty tree. That life will make you behave like God. You will do the things that God will naturally, it will just come to you naturally. Hallelujah. I don't know whether you understand what I'm trying to say. To just be natural. Uh, was this this man that, this apostle that went to South Africa? Gilek. The plague was killing people. But it was not touching him. And the doctors were like, how are you doing it? He said, <laughs> it's simple. He it made those viruses touch my body, they die. What was killing them? It's not the anointing, it's life. It's life. When you acquire the life, the zoe life of God, which cometh by faith. These are things you should claim from God. Oh, hey, I don't have time. Kai. <laughs> okay, okay, let's just quickly rush. Let me rush. I'm, good. I'm not preaching. I just want to read it. Then I shall go. In Jesus' name. I am, I'm bound now. Hallelujah. I need to read this one. First Corinthians, I think it's First Corinthians. Hallelujah. Two. Let me, let me rush down. 
And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech of wisdom, declared unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. May your faith stand in the power of God Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's not in the eloquence of men's words. Many of us pursue men of God, pursue their giftings, pursue their things without building their own faith. It's not God's will that men's faith should not be built. Any, any minister of God that does not build the faith of the people is an antichrist. An antichrist is a man that is working against the interests of Jesus. That's an antichrist. You can be a church man, you can be a minister, you can have the gift of the spirit and you are an antichrist spirit. Because you are working against his interests. What is his interest that will build my church? If you come into his church and you are not building the church with him, you are working against his interest. So you are an antichrist. Am I making sense to you? I'm sorry for many people that do a lot of miracles, miracles. Listen, evangelists were not sent to the church. An evangelist who, is, who works in the supernatural is not supposed to operate in the church. He's supposed to operate outside of the church. The church is a place where men should be built into the stature of Christ. Where a lot of teaching takes place, where a lot of impartation takes place, where a lot of release takes place. Hallelujah. It's not a place for mir- all those miracles. The Bible says, this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. It is those who go out in his name. That promise is potent when you step out of these four corners, and you are among unbelievers. But for the believer, it says, any man sick among you, call the elders, and they will pray over him. They will anoint him with oil. If he has committed anything, the Lord will forgive, and the Lord will raise him up. Hallelujah. There are two different promises. But when you come to church and all you are doing every day is miracle, 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 you are operating in the spirit of Antichrist. The church of, his church is not being built. We must build the church. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Hallelujah. I wish I can preach this. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. It's our glory. There's still a glory that is there. which We must lay hold on it. There's a wisdom of God. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Next verse. But as it is written, I had not seen, nor hear heard. Neither have entered it into the heart of man. The things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I like this. Continue. I'm waiting for you to go. But God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searched all things. Yea, the deep things of God. Next verse. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of man knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. There are two kinds of spirit. There's the spirit of the world and there's the spirit of God. The spirit of God in your life is the spirit of faith. And what it helps you to know that you know the things that are freely given to you, which you can go and ask for. Praise God. Many years ago, God told me. He said many of. He told me. To, I had. I had. A, I had a, It was a dream. It wasn't a dream. Jesus walked up to me and we were talking. I was saying that many of his children ask him a lot of things. He said many of those things are. They don't. They, 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 they are. They are ephemeral things. He said, but it's not that he will not give them. All of those words. But he said, but I wish he will ask for things that are eternal. Things that are eternal. The things that are eternal is in this scripture. What are those that are eternal? The things of God. That only the spirit of God can search and give to you. Those things of God are called the materials of deity. Am I talking to you? Materials of what? Deity. When they, when they take it from God, when the Holy Ghost mines it from God and puts it in you, 
the nature of deity will begin to show in your life. That is what your prayers should be about. That's what, that's what, that is why you begin to see the Paulian prayers. It's not saying, Father in heaven, our daily bread and far. No. That the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. Those are the beginning of the things of God. Because if you're going to carry the nature of deity, oh, I did not show you that. Second Peter 1, I close on that. Go back, go back, go back. This clock is deceiving me. 441. I'm seeing 441. <laughs> oh, 41, okay. No, go to verse 4. I want to close on verse 4. Whereby are given unto us what? Exceeding great and precious promises. That by this, by what? It was by these promises. Ye might be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature is not when you get to heaven. The divine nature is for now. Now faith is. Now faith is. You must graduate from God. Give me a shoe to God. I want this. You have to. For blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You just have to graduate. That by this you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world through lust. You must escape this world's corruption. That corruption is what we read in Romans 8 that Adam subjected creation to. The only way of escape is by those promises. And those promises can only be activated by faith. Abraham believed God even when there was no reason to believe God. It was the only one around on earth believing God. Now the whole testimony of Hebrews 11 is about men that believed God for the impossible. This is impossible, but we must believe God for it. And when we begin to do it, you begin to see the supernatural break out in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Can we bow our heads to pray? Lentos kefrete keshte fusata. Rene brasto precoste libra nashte kepo suta. Libra poste libra haste. This cacato bradisca mahan. Can we just pray in the Lugos for two minutes? This can brados ke henda. Handos ke haya. Lando se prode ke here. Lazandra brados ke posa.